I'm gonna, I think I'm gonna skip my, um, I might skip my slides for the first uh, part because when I was uh, practicing yesterday, I got to like four minutes and 20 seconds. And so I was thinking maybe if I- that, That's fine. Uh, I think we have a lot of people joining us. Hi everyone, thank you so much for being here today. We're just waiting for our more people to come in and we would start in the next two minutes. So till then you can enjoy watching uh, Hannah's beautiful cats that are in the background <laughs> while we get people to You're join. You're welcome. You're welcome to wait here. <laughs> <laughs> And also as you're coming in, um, just as we have a couple of moments here, uh, we're gonna start with a little bit of an icebreaker. And so if you have a moment to grab a pen and something to write on or something to write with, you're welcome to also type if you'd like. I prefer the, I, I think that this exercise is really powerful when you're when you're actually doing the writing um, brain to, to hand, but whatever whatever's available to you will work. And if you don't, that's okay. It'll be, you can also just like sit and think and that is fine as well. Yeah, and anybody who wants to uh, switch on your cameras, you're more than free to switch it on and even say hi, because we got to wait for the one last minute and start at sharp 10.03. So yeah. Till then, it's an open, open flow. Cool. I think we've reached the ten o three mark. So I'm going to start, and I think people will join in as we go because we don't want to delay our session too much. So thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. Uh, today, we wanted to bring to you an interesting conversation where we wanted to get a chance for all of us to reflect on the words that we use, and especially the words we use in this, in our, um, in, the, in the environmental space that we are in. So uh, for that, we thought it would be a great opportunity to get a chance to, for us to come and have a conversation and think about it. Uh, we do. We all understand that you know words have an immense power. They can help sh shape and re make us rethink uh, things, make a make us shape the values that exist in the world, and also the perceptions of how we see things. And because the power of this as uh, that words have, we want to ensure that we, as the youth uh, storytellers of the future and activists, we actually take an opportunity to uh, think about these words and what they mean and what what we are trying to communicate to the rest of the planet. And, and the people on this planet and how we are trying to advocate for what we believe in. So we wanted to get a, a, give a chance for all of us in this busy time to pause and just look at that and think about it once to ensure that we are doing, we are doing the best we can to communicate in the best way so that we give the right meaning and the right impressions of what we want to say. Uh, and yeah, and hopefully together today by thinking about this, we will be able to think of our stories and we will be able to create something that can change today's dominant narrative and maybe even change the system. So uh, yeah, with this short overview, I would like us to get into the, this amazing session we have planned for you. Um, I am uh, uh, Shweta Sotrabhashyam and I'm uh, from India. I am the Global South Focal Point for the Global Youth Biodiversity Network. And today we would be introducing all our speakers by talking about what uh, gives them butterflies when they think about nature. So I'm gonna start off with mine first. And uh, so what gives me butterflies always is when I close my eyes and I remember the first time that when I was studying stumptail macaques in uh, the forest of Assam, that one of the monkeys after a few months of following them had come to me and tried to smell my shirt. And just the feeling that an animal felt so close, felt uh, trustworthy enough to come and smell my shirt always gives me goosebumps that just to think of that feeling. So yeah, so with that amazing story of mine, I would like to uh, introduce you guys to the first amazing speaker we have today, who's gonna to give a welcome message. We have Melina Sakiyama, who's the founder of uh, Gibbon. And she's also the Medoria Award uh, winner for last year. 
And uh, yeah, uh, for her, uh, what gives her butterflies is the feeling of entering the ocean, the freshness, the sounds, and the totality of the ocean always gives her butterflies. So uh, with that, uh, Melina, over to you. And please uh, welcome everybody to this amazing session. Yeah, hello, everyone. Thank you so much. I'm not sure where you're coming from, but it's really great to have you here for this conversation and this nice experience that we're all going to share. As Trisa mentioned, like words do matter, right? And more and more, like um, we're living in this world that we are only connecting more or less through through words, especially now that we are so sort of like far from each other because of the pandemic, because of the social distancing, we are not being able to have as much probably social interaction or as much touching each other or exploring other senses that we have to communicate, to, to connect, to share. Um, so I think it's really important for us to think about what are we doing with the words and that nowadays, like because of the way modern society has evolved and, and, and all those kind of things, like words are playing probably more role in decision-making than ever before, right? And so like how we are expressing our feelings and emotions and ideas comes into words. So, and a lot of us activists, sometimes we forget it. I mean, not, not probably us from given because we are doing like policy for the, 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 the CBD, the conventional biological processes. So words are kind of like our lives at the moment. And like a lot of decisions happen, like, you know, because of certain words or certain like comas, you know, so there is all this thing. But for the majority of activists, maybe like when you work in the ground and you're more sort of connected to the people and so on, words might not be that much of a, an influence, right? Um, so I think we're here today to kind of explore all the power of word and like how we can apply that, how we can discuss, how we can create a debate about how we are shifting things through words and how we can shift things to the better, right? How we can rebuild pathways, right? how we can reconnect with each other, with nature and, and with the planet, like through words as well. Okay, so thank you so much for joining us. We have an amazing, amazing team of like people today to like facilitate this discussion and to share this moment with us. So welcome everybody and thank you so much. Thank you so much, Melina. Uh, I, that was a great uh, way to sequence into what we want all of you to start thinking about. And for us to get a chance to get into that space of reflecting, we have an amazing uh, reflection exercise by Krista. Krista is the founder and director of Co Coalition Wild in the United States. And the smell and the colors that nature can, uh, that, that can only be found in nature is what gives her butterflies. So yeah, Krista, over to you and uh, please take it away. Thank you, and thank you everyone for joining. And so to give us an opportunity, no matter where you are, if you're just starting your day, if you're just ending your day, um, but bringing us all here for the next 60 or so minutes, uh, I want to walk us through a little bit of an exercise that can help to ground us all and, and get us in the same headspace to be open to the conversation that we're about to have. Um, and so as I do a little bit of an introduction, I had already said this, but if you're just joining us, um, please grab something to write with and something to write on. Um, <clears throat> if you don't have that and you want to just type, that's absolutely fine as well. If you don't have any of that, just being uh, sitting with your eyes closed and, and thinking will also work just fine. Um, but, but what uh, we're going to go through for the next about eight or so minutes is a free writing exercise. And essentially what I'm going to ask you to do is um, to simply write. I want you to put your, your pen or pencil down on the paper. Don't worry about punctuation. Don't worry about the way something is spelt. Write in your mother tongue. But I want you to write in a, a stream of consciousness. Um, I think for many of us, we are, and as Melina was saying, we are very tied to words, especially when they're used in different contexts, right? Not only do we have to worry about how we interpret the meaning of a word, but we have to hope that when we use it, the person that we're using it for 
is also understanding it in the way that we intend them to understand it. And it can be a lot, it can be really exhausting and sometimes we can get weighed down by it. So for this exercise, I want us to just do away with that and surrender to the idea that we can just sometimes speak and trust that our the, the intention and the feeling behind the words will come through. And so um, I'm gonna start a timer. And for the first minute, I'm going to ask you literally to just write whatever comes up in your mind. It can literally say, I don't know what to write over and over and over again until something else comes to your mind. And then write that you could say, Krista, I think this exercise is incredibly stupid and that's okay too. But I don't want you to stop. I don't want you to pause and consider, just go. Um, and then here and there, I'm going to, to drop in and say a sentence or two or a prompt, something to think about. Um, and if it speaks to you, if it resonates, please start working that into whatever you're writing or let it show up in your writing really naturally. If it doesn't, if you're on a tangent and you're just going, just keep going and disregard me. And that's totally fine too. Um, so we'll start here. I'm just opening up my timer. Um, and so if you all are ready, I will start it here for about a minute and um, go and just start writing. To answer your question, your question, Gretel, too, you are writing about anything that comes to mind. This is just stream of consciousness writing. Anything at all, do not stop. Do not, your only rule is to not stop, to not pick your, your pen or paper up or your typing. Thank you for asking. I'm gonna invite you to start thinking about or start in introducing into your writing, how does nature smell? And again, you don't have to answer that question deliberately or directly, just see how it shows up and whatever comes out. Our next piece that I would love for you to work in is how does nature feel? Again, you don't have to answer that question specifically. Just see how the word of nature and feel shows up in, in your mind, in the context. <clears throat> Hi, I'm Maura from Peru. Do you, do you listen to me? Yes, no? Hi, Mara. Yep, we're all just um, silently writing right now. Um, oh. Anything that comes uh, to yep. uh, in, in a doc document? Uh, you can write on a piece of paper or, oh. um, or just think of it in your mind. Or if you'd like to type, you can type as well. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, thanks. Krista, I think they are asking in the chat to repeat the question. Sure, sure. Um, yeah, so I'm just going through a, a, a series of questions that are going to change about every minute. Um, and they're not specifically questions that you have to answer. Um, they're just prompts for your writing. So the next one is, how does nature taste? Mm 
Your next one is what are the sounds of nature or what does nature sound like? And finally, how would you describe nature? Are there certain words you would like to use? What comes to mind when you think about being in nature? How would you describe it to somebody who's never experienced it? We're gonna wrap it up here in about 30 seconds. So if you have any final thoughts or as you begin coming to the end of your, your thought stream, if there's any other pieces that you want to write down, please feel free to do so now. I'm going to ask you to come back. You can turn your videos on if you'd like. You can keep them off if you like. But I want to encourage you to not necessarily read over what you've written. Not right now, or maybe not even in the future. You could always just toss out or delete whatever you've just created. But rather, I want you to sit for the, an, a moment. I'll give you about 30 seconds to a minute to see how you feel. Were there certain words that came up? Was there a certain feeling behind those words that you were surprised about or that continued to, to weave a thread through everything that, that was, you know, that you were writing or, or that was flowing through you? If there's anything that you do want to share, any specific insights, even if there was a specific sentence that just poured out of you, feel free to put it in the chat. And I want us, as we are going into this session, I wanna invite you to remain open to the different connotations that could come from come with words and be behind words. You know, we're all coming from different cultures, different experiences, different mother tongues. And, and words are really uh, powerful as we've already said, and as we're going to con be uh, continuing to say. And being patient and being open to the words that others used and, and being willing to meet somebody and understanding what they are meaning when they say something versus how you take a 
a word based on your experience and understanding. It's a really important perspective to be able to see from both sides. And so, um, yeah, if you'd like to share anything, please feel free to do so, but I will pass it back to Sveta. Thank you so much, uh, Krista, for the amazing uh, reflection. I think that was really nice and it did feel very settling and good. I, uh, I hope all of you could also share some of what you felt uh, in the chat so that we see how everybody reacted to this amazing reflection session. Uh, we are now going to go into uh, the, 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 the part where we're going to hear from amazing people across the globe who are going to talk about this topic. And um, we have, uh, have, we have uh, a beautiful uh, selection of panelists who are joining us today. And we're going to start off with Hannah from Earth Advocacy Youth, Ecuador where she says that uh, walking in the forest and knowing that the trees around are communicating eat with each other through their roots is what gives her butterflies. And uh, she would be talking today with us about dissecting the dominant narrative and sh uh, of shaping our uh, perceptions of nature. Um, to let all of you know, we would be going live for just this session because we want everybody to hear what all, you, uh, all the amazing panelists have to say. So. Uh, I hope that's okay with all of you. So thank you so much. And yeah, over to you, Hannah. Hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here and to share the space with you. Um, as Swata said today, I will be sharing some personal reflections and, um, and observations around today's dominant narrative and how we, by rediscovering our words and our story can strengthen and amplify transformational change. Um, so one observation that I made uh, some years ago um, was that in many countries and human cultures around the world, non-human living systems are seen as human-owned objects whose reason for existence is to be commodified, exploited, and used for human benefits uh, and economic profit. And this is today's dominant narrative and it permeates almost all spaces in which economic power is fostered and decision-making occurs. Now, a pillar within this destructive narrative is how nature is spoken about through a cognitive dichotomy that separates the human from nature and arrogantly enough states that humans are not only somehow disconnected from, but also superior to uh, the rest of nature. And this is concerning because the narrative fuels a human governance system that permits anthropocentric violence against all other life on earth. So my take on this here was that if we want to change the system, we must change uh, the narrative. And how do we change the narrative? My conclusion here is that we question, we dissect, we reflect, we shape, and we reshape. It is a never ending uh, process. Um, and so the world is made up of diverse narratives that construct our understandings of ourselves and the world around us. And each narrative comes with a set of patterns, values, and relationships, which are reflected in the words we use to construct that narrative. So this means that each of us have unique understandings of nature because our interactions and emotional bonds with the rest of the natural world shape the meaning each of us give to that word. I personally believe in building a narrative that recognizes that the earth is embedded in a complex system that governs the web of life. A narrative that understands that in order to effectively protect all earth's living systems, humans included, of course, we must understand their intrinsicality interconnectedness and aliveness. So why am I talking so much about word and story? When it comes to defending and protecting Earth's web of life, it is essential that I ask myself if the way I speak of nature and the way I, have const I construct our relationship with nature of which I am part is genuinely reflecting the message that I wish to convey in my environmental work or in my activism or whatever it can be. If it is incentivizing the type of impacts that I wish to generate myself and that I wish the world to generate as a global community. And this is a topic that I personally think is not discussed enough. Um, we can sit and talk about what should be done 
and what's wrong with the world and what doesn't work, but that won't get us far enough. Um, transformational change will only come when we, and especially youth, dissect, challenge, and transform the dominant narrative that lays the foundation for and fuels the world's uh, current human governance system. So trust in the power of your story and dare to challenge it every day. Um, we are in a never ending journey and we are, we're constantly learning new things. And so we need to all go back and pause for a moment to think about, okay, if I, what is, how am I speaking about nature? Um, do I, do I say, for example, one thing that I, um, that I do is that I look at, okay, um, if I am, if my message is that I am nature, I, for example, cannot say something like humans and nature, because that automatically creates the separation. And that doesn't convey the message that I have, that I want to share and convey to the world. So that's just one example. And that's my personal example. Um, so looking at how do we speak and how do we, how does this, what kind of patterns do we want to produce or reproduce through our language? Thank you. Thank you so much for that. And thank you so much for the deep uh, provocation to help also people think of how they would like to reflect on their words they use. Um, I think our next panelist is going to talk about uh, something that goes now from connecting the words to actions. So we have Flavia, who's uh, from, uh, who is, uh, who represents Plant for the Planet and as well as Coalition Wild in Brazil. And for her, the silence beneath the ocean gives her butterflies. Uh, so she would be talking to us a little bit about the narratives on nature and talk uh, and taking concrete action on the ground. So yeah, Flavia, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Svata. Hi, everyone. Um, what I want to share with you today, it's uh, a story that I lived it like eight years ago. Uh, I was like a graduation student and I was doing a research around primate biodiversity. But what I learned from this experience was uh, much more with the people that were living there in, in their lands. So I would like to talk with you about the Pomeranians. It's a people that came to Brazil during the World War II. So the, their land doesn't uh, exist, any, exist anymore. It's a region uh, between Germany and Poland. And during the war, they, they immigrate and they came um, to Brazil. So during my, my research in the Atlantic forest, I've match these people. So they live in the mountains here in Brazil, uh, in the southeastern region. And this uh, ecosystem, the Atlantic forest, is very endangered, endangered uh, now. We just have 7% left. And I found that the Pomeranians has a big role in the, in the conservation in, in the Atlantic forest. And I would like to share with you a little bit how they use words and how what we can learn from, from them. So in, uh, the Pomeranians, they are the largest vegetable producers in, in this stage that's called Espirito Santo, is in the coast of Brazil. And in their lands, we can find uh, six species of monkeys. So two of these species are very endangered. Um, is the Muruki, the northern Muruki, and it's the biggest monkey of America, so it, it's very famous. I don't know if you heard about. And so the Pomeranians, the Pomeranians, they live uh, very close with these species because they are they have small lands, familiar agriculture, and the forest is very near to the houses. So. Um, in the back of their houses, that's a lot of forest and it's beautiful. It's one of the most beautiful places that I that I met. So um, they have this true connection with their lands and the forest. So they have specific words that they use to refer to the monkeys. So it's not the same words that Brazilians use because they have all this uh, cultural and traditional uh, knowledge that 
uh, came with with them um, since they came to from the Pomeranian regions. So they use their mother language until today. So since they they came, they use their language, and it's very special to to hear them talk with with each other, and and they use a specific words. Uh, for these monkeys, so they named these monkeys the six species uh, with by their experiences. So they see the, they see um, how how the vocalization is. They see how the the monkeys looks like, and they name it after um, with a specific words. So just to bring one example, this muriki monkey, the the biggest one, um, they have. Uh, a white uh, color, so they call them um, in Pomerania would be something like um, hang step, which is the white monkey. And also they give names uh, because of the vocalization, like the other species, the Atlantic Titi, they call uh, Lakhap, I think this is how it speaks, uh, which means monkey who laughs because it's a really it's a vocalization that is really loud and also um, very long, long and, lo and loud laugh. So this uh, shows us how they they are really connected with these species, not only with monkeys but a, a lot of um, biodiversity, biodiversity from the Atlantic forests. And we can learn a lot with them because um, they they value their lands like in a really high price. When we asked them if they would sell their lands, that it's very small and simple lands for a million reais would be like two hundred and fifty thousand dollars. They said to us that they wouldn't sell. You know, they they really knows that the nature, the forest, and everything that they have there, it's very special and they wouldn't sell for any value in, in the world. So it's very beautiful, beautiful to see how, how they, they bring this value to their lands. And they, it's not that they are really rich, you know, they are really poor people actually, but they know that happiness is more than money. So their lands is very, very special to them. So what we have to learn with them also about these words, because they only use these words because they have a background and a context that made uh, them to use these words, right? This connection with nature, also this background from the migration and everything that they produce and how they produce also. So this makes me reflect about how we use our words today. What, what is the background that makes us uh, use the words that we are using, you know, related to nature, but also with with other um, other vocabulary also um, besides the nature. And I think I just I pass <laughs> the four minutes, but I'm finishing. Um, I just want to share with you guys that they are very like the indigenous people and other traditional um, peoples, they are really concerned with nature. And today the city that they live, they are called the Muriki city because of this relation uh, with, with the forest and with the monkeys. And I think we can um, learn a lot with, with the story. So this is, what I would like to share with you. Uh, I will share also a presentation in the chat if you want to uh, know more about the Pomeranians. So thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that, Flavia. And definitely like when you were talking, I could really think about how I know from India as well, that every language that we have in India has a way of describing different things in nature. And some of these things don't even have parallel names in English which makes it so cool, like the sound that just the stream makes has a name uh, in one of our Indian languages. And, you know, we don't have such specific names for different things. Like, and, and what you were saying today really did bring back some of those memories of how I remember things from, our, from my, my culture as well. So thank you so much for sharing with us such a deep uh, uh, story, which is so personal to you. Um, 
I think we will now going to we would like to talk to the next speaker we have. We have David Ainsworth, uh, who's the information officer at the Convention on Biological Diversity. Uh, we're really happy that he could join us today. So thank you so much for being here with us, David. Uh, uh, for him, what gives him butterfly, butterflies is when he walks in nature, uh, especially now during COVID, when he gets a chance to go out. He loves the sound that the breeze makes and the sound that the birds are making now that spring is coming close. Uh, that's what gives him butterflies. So uh, with that, I would like to introduce to you what David would talk about. He, would, he will be talking to you guys about nature and biodiversity for communication, talking to you on how to convey your message with a story and a narrative. So thank you so much, David, and over to you. Great. Thanks. Thanks very much, Swet. And thanks so much to everyone who's spoken so far. Um, it's been very inspirational. I've got a page of writing from Krista's uh, exploration and then Hannah's and Flavia's stories were very, very, very inspiring indeed. So what I, what I want to do is rather than present, here's the way to tell your story in the spirit of us all sharing experiences and perspectives. Let me talk to you about one way that that has inspired me to tell stories uh, about nature and, and convey action. Um, because we're based on words, I guess the, the words that I'll use to maybe convey this little thing I'm going to tell you about is uh, I'll use three for now. Three is always a good number when you're telling stories. Uh, it's about connect, it's about change, and it's about community. So a lot of when we talk about narrative, I think it's about us telling little stories to people. And so that's whether we are trying to convey our own personal activism, uh, whether or not we're trying to convince a policymaker or, or convince other groups of people to move forward. We like to work through small stories. And I think the stories can have sort of three different parts to them as well. Three is such a great magical number, certainly for the culture that I've grown up in, you know, three is, a, is, a, is an important part. Um, so the first part is I think when any, you're, you're gonna tell a story about biodiversity, you first wanna talk about someone, whether it's an individual or whether it's a group and how they're connected with nature. Um, and th that's sort of a, a statement because we are formed by the environments that we are in. Uh, and part of, you know, when we're talking about this new narrative, as Hannah talked about this absence separation, you want to tell a story about how someone or some actor, they're connected to nature. Now, when you talk about this connection with nature, a lot of the stories that we're working on are about transformation. So in fact, these stories, this first connection should have an element of, you know, what's beautiful about this connection, but there also needs to be a talk about what needs to be changed, what's maybe slightly problematic in it. So the story should be about how this initial state of someone um, has the potential for beauty, but something has to be changed. Stories are always more exciting, I find anyway, when there's a bit of a challenge, there's an overcoming for it, right? So that you have a state, but there's something you've got to overcome. And it's through the, the, the creativity uh, of the person, through discussions of how they move forward, um, uh, that, that, that motivate this change and move people on it. And the creativity, I think, should always be expressed in terms of three things. I went to a really excellent workshop last year where people talked about any action that we do ourselves has to do uh, with our heads, with rational thinking. It has to do with our heart, with these emotional actions and things we do, but it has to do with our hands. What are the actual concrete actions that we carry out? So your story should be about overcoming a challenge. And what are the way that these three things that your mind, your heart, and your actual manipulation of things can make a difference as well. And so that story should be about how was success realized? What, what went through with that? Uh, and then that takes you to the transformation because with any sort of challenge you overcome, it's about change. And that's the second word. So the change that needs to come about. We all change in our lives through our processes. Life, in fact, goes through a number of processes, whatever sort of thing we're looking at. Uh, and so your story should be about what is that change as well? Uh, and then what has transformed and how does it move forward? And the final part, I think, is community because I think the important part for any story about things we do is that as you come through and work with nature and work with this challenge, how have you expanded your community? How have you changed your community in terms of membership or in terms of its thought? Because then it becomes an engagement, not just of you, an individual or an individual group with nature, but it's about how you're connected to something larger and bigger. So this is one type of story. And I'd, I'd like to you know, see as we go through the day, how that sort of storyline fits. But again, it's about, we need to tell stories that talk about connection that talk about the ability of people to change, to overcome challenges, and then how they build communities uh, as a result of that. 
Um, and I think it's important for anything we do. I mean, the community that you are building with the Global Youth Biodiversity Network is around the area. Uh, and indeed, it's part of an overall community of people who want to transform our relationship with the planet. So um, those are my ideas on one mo model of telling stories. Uh, and I look forward to us talking about this more over the course of the session today. Thanks. Thanks very much. Wow, that was amazing. Thank you so much, David. And definitely this could be something that we could take in and try to even practice today itself in our session because we have an amazing uh, conversation after the uh, after the panelists where you guys can create your own stories. And this could be an amazing start for us and a place where it could guide us there. So uh, now following David, we have um, Abigail who is the focal point for Indigenous People's Rights and Human Rights Program at Tabtaba. Uh, and what gives her butterflies is uh, hearing the rustling of bamboo on a breezy day and walking up, uh, waking up to the chirping of the birds on a good morning. Uh, with that beautiful description of what gives her butterflies, uh, I would like to invite Abigail to share with us some of her perspectives as an indigenous youth on nature and the biodiversity and how she looks at communicating for biodiversity. Over to you, Abigail. Okay, thank you, Shweta, and all the speakers before me. So I'm not as articulate as I sound in my head, so I will be needing the aid of a slide. I hope uh, I do keep in time. So uh, can you see my, okay, sorry. It's just Can stopping. you see my slide? Yes, we can see it. Okay, I think I'll try to be quick. So uh, just a background. So I'm an, uh, I'm Abby, I'm an in indigenous person, but I, sorry, what happened? But I live in the, oops, but I live in the city and um, yeah, I live in the city. And uh, one of the challenges that I'm actually overcoming right now is, um, what you call this, is uh, learning my indigenous tongue. So that's, one thing that uh, I would like to learn. Anyway, so my screen is not showing. I'll just. Did I open it for you? Uh, yeah, if that would be fine with you, Seta. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry. Uh, but anyway, uh, you know, uh, because I live in the city, right? Sometimes uh, when you talk to young professionals at uh, our age, when you say that. Uh, uh, we need to look for, uh, we need peace and tranquility. We often uh, think of nature immediately. And actually that's great. I actually also do that myself, but sometimes I also think that it's a very anthropogenic way of looking at nature because uh, nature is actually very noisy. Like I said, we can hear the rustling of the bamboos and the chirping of um, the, the birds and etc. And it's actually, uh, there's a lot of activity and processes behind uh, uh, nature and maybe it's our role to recognize the melody and uh, maybe instead of quelling the noise we could actually maybe sing and harmonize with uh, the melody of nature. So uh, with that being said I guess uh, there are I'd just like to share some perspectives on like uh, four maybe thoughts or ideas through which we can communicate about nature. So um, uh, I'm coming as an indigenous youth, but I know that this is relatable for everybody, right? So um, <clears throat> just, I'm just sharing in my experience and context. So first, so I would like to relate nature to place, language, stories and values and security and well-being. So first to place, so for a lot of indigenous youth, uh, we are, our identity and pride is actually tied to where we come from, from our ancestral lands. And this is a picture um, of where our forefathers, my forefathers were buried and it says from soil we were formed and soil we returned to. So um, a lot of the traditional place names actually in the city where I'm from actually reflect the nature and biodiversity that are found in it. So I think it's great to recall um, like the traditional place names of areas where we live in and it may inspire us to see what nature is there. Um, second language, this was already explained by the speakers before me very well. So it's, I think it's really underrated <clears throat> knowledge that uh, it's, under, it's really underrated that um, our 
knowledge for different terms for different for nature and biodiversity for so for example like to add the sami have different words for um snow and in the asia asian countries have a lot of words for rice and the processes that involves with uh, uh, processing or harvesting rice another is um the importance of stories and values because um, like me growing up, I also, I, um, a lot of the stories I heard from the elders are actually in relation to nature, like there are kindred spirits in the, um, in the mountains, such as the one presented there, or maybe there's a, um, uh, uh, like a big monster in the middle of the lake that's presented there and uh, these areas are uh, these pictures here at the right side they're actually ICCA areas in the Philippines so indigenous community conserved areas and so it's important to even if they're not scientific evidence it's important to um, share the stories and values to create emotional connection just as what um, David mentioned a while ago and then lastly that it's important to communicate really that um, you know uh, nature is important for our security and well-being and uh, vice versa we can also actually contribute to um, secure to um, helping nature uh, security security the security and well-being of nature so um, we uh, in this call we keep on uh, talking about connection and uh, it's good to revitalize our connection with nature and to build on uh, our roles uh, through communication so that's it thank you thank you so much for that abigail and uh, i think everybody would definitely resonate with a lot of the things you talked about and how you mentioned uh, the different stories. When you were talking about the story, it reminded me of the story that I heard when I was working in the forest, where they told me that there was uh, the, the the part about the monsters. They did tell me there's like a ghost that comes in every time you cut a part of the forest. There's like a forest ghost and then there's a fire ghost. <laughs> so they're like different names for all these ghosts that come in and then they walk in the places wherever they've cut the forest. So yeah, they're really cool, interesting stories that do come in with, you know, our narratives. And uh, yeah, then thank you so much for bringing us uh, to, to show us that connection with of how we can you know see ourselves with nature uh, i think for us today we're coming to the end of our panel discussion where our panelists uh, have an opportunity to share things but we definitely would like them to stay on longer uh, so the last speaker today we have is munib who's from conservation Optim optimism he's from india and for him standing on top of a mountain and realizing how small we are compared to the landscape around us and yet have a significant ability, uh, an ability to have a significant influence is what gives him butterflies. And uh, so Muni would talk to us today about how words, how the words we use uh, to craft our messages in context with, uh, co in context with our work in nature can be done. And yeah, uh, so Muni, over to you. Great, thank you. Thank you so much uh, for that introduction, uh, Shweta, and thanks. Uh, to all the panelists who, who spoke before me, I mean, there's uh, so much uh, to think about and sort of coming at the end, I'm just thinking, yeah, you know, what value can I add after listening to all the wonderful <laughs> points that were made, but hopefully in the next three to four minutes, I'd like to share with everyone a little bit about what conservation optimism really is and how we can use that to, you know, better communicate uh, for nature. At, at, at a large, you know, um, if you look around in the world's media or just talking to people, there's a lot of doom and gloom with which we maybe talk about nature, biodiversity, or the issues around us. And we at Conservation Optimism, which is really a movement and a network of people, believe, you know, that's not really helpful uh, to do something uh, good, good for nature, the, the, the whole doom and gloom there is. Because in reality, uh, the reality is not sort of th that sort of black and white, because if you look through in between that doom and gloom, there's a lot of different stories of positivity, of, of attempts, uh, of, of change for the better for people and, and for nature, right? Like these are not, uh, Hannah spoke about how this dichotomy is not, not really helpful because, you know, in, in many ways uh, or in, in, in reality, it's one people are uh, with nature. And we believe really in these stories, uh, you know, within this mosaic, these these positive stories are something that we can replicate in different areas, even these, even if these are small in terms of their scale or their impact. Uh, but also, more importantly, which perhaps doesn't get spoken enough, is 
even if we think of things as failures, to think about them and be okay, think about what we can learn from those those failures. You know, do not just not uh, forget about them or not not talk about them, right? So sharing with a more optimistic yet uh, positive outlook is 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 quite important. And I specifically want to speak about uh, how words can really really matter, and uh, and I want to do that with a quick story from from where I come from, up in the mountains in India. We have a lot of issues with leopards uh, where where we live, and for a long time. Um, you know, uh, leopards would kill people, leopards would kill also people's livestock. And a lot of the communication around these leopards was all about how they were manhunters. So people would talk about, oh, you know, go home, these leopards are manhunters, you know, or, or people hunters, they will, they will kill you. Slowly over time, you know, a lot of different people started engaging with which, uh, the way people were talking about these leopards and started trying to sensitize people towards running away from this sort of notion of manhunting leopards to think about these issues as negative human wildlife interactions. And people started talking about how, you know, because of urbanization or different sort of land use patterns in, in, in the place where I come from, you know, the, the leopards are sort of displaced out of their forests or their forests are reducing and that results in this sort of coming together of people and leopards and, you know, the depredation uh, happening. And while this might seem quite trivial, it's quite important because the way people started thinking about the problem really changed because the way we were using words really changed, right? So, so when people were thinking about man-eating lepers, they were thinking about, oh, this negative predator. But when people started thinking about negative human-wildlife interactions and how they might happen, people started thinking about potential mitigation uh, strategies. And suddenly, the leopard was not the villain, which is part of you know, an unfortunate series of events. Uh, and then people started working on it. So I do believe you know, words have, have a lot of power uh, in doing positive and negative. So we should be very careful uh, with which... Uh, how how we use them and just very quickly uh i'm not a communicator myself in the sense of like i'm not trained in communications um but my colleagues at uh, conservation optimism they've come up uh with this wonderful sort of toolkit or uh, it's called the positive communication toolkit because many of us have the right intentions right we want to say the right messages we want to say the right stories but we might not have the skills and the expertise to do so i certainly wouldn't say i i, I have that right and and this toolkit really sort of helps and guides us and empowers us to make these positive statements and these positive sort of messages uh, for nature. And I'll drop that in the chat so people can look at it. But to, to just take 30 seconds to, to, to talk about what it basically tells us, you know, when we're talking about any story, particularly trying to communicate something about nature, it's important to th think about three things. Um, uh, I guess David would like the rule of three here as well, you know, thinking about what really your objective is, right? Um, what do you want to achieve uh, with, with the piece of communication you're doing? Who your audience is um, and what the desired outcome uh, really is. You know, just taking a moment to reflect on those and then realizing that there are beliefs and values that you might come with uh, that might be based in the language you speak, the place you come from, that will shape how you say things. And then there are potentially traps that you might not intend to sort of fall trapped to, but you fall trapped to anyways. Um, you know, for one, uh, I, I mean, I do a bit of research on human wildlife interactions, but for years I would call it human wildlife conflict. Uh, but when you realize it's actually not really human wildlife conflict, it's conflict between two sectors of human society, one trying to conserve the animals and one trying to, let's say, uh, you know, conserve their livestock. So those traps you fall into and this toolkit sort of illustrates what are some of the traps uh, that we can fall prey to and try to avoid. Um, and I just hope, you know, this is one of uh, many wonderful um, resources that can help us, um, uh, you know, make positive notes for nature. Uh, my colleague, Julia, I think has just put, a, put the link for, for the toolkit. So I, I really hope, um, I'll, I'll stop there and I really hope this toolkit would be a useful um, sort of uh, place to look for. And yeah, thanks again, everyone for coming and, and sharing your thoughts. Thank you, Shweta. Yeah, thank you so much, Muneev. And thank you for the beautiful examples. It really did help us think about the, you know, operationalizing this and thinking of how actually communication can play such a key role in so many different ways of, you know, envisioning the whole, uh, the conflict itself, which you talked about. And now it's more of a relationship and an interaction. So uh, I think, uh, we, uh, thank you so much for all the panelists for giving us these valuable insights. I think we would like to now uh, go to, slowly move to the next part where we would like to know what nature means to you. 
And to bring to start with that session, I would uh, invite all the panelists to share a very short 30 second message of what it means to you guys, and then sequence into all the amazing people who are in this conversation with us so that they can share it as well. And while the panelists uh, share, it would be great if you guys could uh, raise your hand or put your question in the chat so that uh, the panelists could take a few questions from the audience. So uh, yeah, so with that, I would say, uh, maybe we could start with Hannah again and then go in the same order. Of course. Okay, great. So I have I prepared like this little uh, mini section. Um, so for me, nature is the web of life composed by interactive and reciprocal relationships, which connects every organism on earth into one planetary and complex interdependent ecosystem. For me, the web of life is not a series of objects or entities, uh, but a process of crisscrossing relationships which exist in symbiosis. Perfect, thank you so much for that. Uh, I um, think next, uh, next, sorry. Yeah, please go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Oh, I, I didn't prepare anything. Uh, I think in one word, I could say that nature for me means balance. I think this is, yeah, balance. Awesome, thank you. Maybe a more dynamic balance, which is constantly changing, but it's still in balance, yeah? That, that is beautiful. Uh, the next speaker, uh, I think we have, David, I think David, it's your turn to tell us. It's my it. turn? Okay, yeah. great. So yeah, um, gosh, I wasn't quite prepared for this, but I think for me, nature is, I mean, like some of the things I've heard from Flavia Han and Hannah before, nature is this, this energy of uh, produced by movement, by relationships, by exchanges of all the different living things and the systems uh, around me. It surrounds me, uh, it's part of me as well. Um, uh, and it's the thing that, that is our being, it's kind of invisible, uh, but we need to take moments when we can sort of be aware of what it is. And so uh, being aware that it's the, the food that sustains us, uh, it's the air and ecosystems that, that give us identity and meaning. So it's the medium around us uh, and it's a medium that we need to work with rather than against. Thanks. Thank you. Abigail? Uh, hello, sorry. Um, all the speakers before me gave such uh, very good <laughs> answers and all I can think of was um, this one shared by a, um, and the, uh, a, ch a child that I interviewed before and he said that nature was like a fast food restaurant for him. So in the Philippines, it's called Jollibee. It's like McDonald's. And uh, he said that because uh, you can, you are sustained by it, you get food from it, plus you have air con, because in the Philippines it's hot, it's because of the trees that, so it's because of trees that are found in me, so yeah, that's it. <laughs> that is the coolest example, <laughs> the explanation I've ever heard of nature. <laughs> Thank you so much, Abigail, for sharing that with us. Muni, what about you? <laughs> Um, I don't think mine is as cool as Abigail's, uh, but, <laughs> but I, I'll try. Um, I mean, nature to me, sort of uh, two words come to mind when I think of nature. I guess those would be empathy and respect, uh, because nature to me is about, you know, something larger than just oneself or, or one entity. And uh, if, we can, if we do not have the ability to respect and try and empathize with so many of these different moving parts, uh, uh, you know, we'll, we'll end up doing more harm than good. And I think nature epitomizes that for me. So yeah, that's, that's what nature is for me. Thanks for that, Muneeb. Uh, Melina, we have you who's uh, raised your hand. Would you like to go? Yeah, no, actually, I, I just wanted to ask a question. Is, is that the time for questions? <laughs> I, I, I just wanted to, I mean, it's more a reflection and a question um, about the talk by Muni on like positive communication. Because like from my experience, um, like working uh, for so long with biodiversity and the status of biodiversity in, in our planet, like I, I feel that sometimes when 
I mean, the scenario is, is very complicated, right? And I think like, especially for young people, like, cause we are, we have been working with young people a lot. And like the feelings that I have around us in our community, it's not as simple as like, just, you know, being positive and that we have to be positive and communicate positive messages. Like it, it's so much more layered, you know, there is a, an enormous feeling of sorrow of like, you know, loss, um, frustration, which are not necessarily positive emotions, right? But they are also valid and legitimated because our generation is gonna, is being faced with very, very, very complicated challenges. And sometimes I feel that like because people try to simplify the word so much you know and not try to kind of like be more deep about it sometimes like we tend to prioritize those of like either very extreme negative feelings or very extreme positive feelings and then we miss a lot of in the in between and we we miss a lot of the depth and i think what we can do with words should should be like try to like delve more into this depth try to like encompass all the feelings that we are feeling even though they might not be the most positive ones or like not the complete negative ones but i do think that more and more i see on social media and all this kind of things that and especially like within the conservation community like a huge push to just be positive about it and I've seen like some organizations being criticized by that, like, because are we trying to silence or make it invisible, like the communication of the pain of the world and the, and the pain of the communities and so on? Um, should we then, instead of just going forward with positive, like, should then we try to encompass like this more depth of feelings into our communications. Maybe the outlook could be positive, but I'm not sure if we should just kind of like say like, no, let's, you know, like let, let's try to, to, to get rid of the doom and gloom, like, and kind of like present this sort of positive um, thing. So I don't know, I, I, I feel very sort of like, um, like I, I feel that we need to find better ways, you know, than than just kind of like be completely positive. That we need to to be able to enable people to like find an outlet for their emotions, because otherwise we are gonna get sick emotionally, right? Because we are dealing with things that are really difficult. We are feeling depressed about that, but somehow we we don't know how to communicate that in a way that like is sort of like kind of like legitimated, I, I mean, it, it makes a way for our feelings, but it can also bring the transformation and the, and the change that we want. And I've also heard for a lot of activists, like especially in social um, struggles, that without feeling the frustration and without feeling what is wrong, without actually feeling some anger even towards it, it's difficult to kind of ignite the feeling of change, feeling that we really need to change. So I was just wondering, I'm so sorry for my long uh, reflection, how you guys <laughs> think about that and like what, 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 if you have anything to compliment on that. Thank you. Would any of the panelists like to go? And if I quickly share my thoughts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, thanks, thanks, Melina. That's such an important point. I mean, and, and, and that's uh, what you, there, you know, that sort of hits the nail on, on the head. So I think the one thing that I can say is positivity for the sake of positivity is not helpful. Uh, and that's not uh, what personally I would advocate for, or, or I, I would hope uh, none of us perhaps would uh, advocate for that because that's sort of, you know, just um, not, not the purpose. I think uh, nuance is, is the most important thing. Uh, but I think uh, I'll try to illustrate with an example what I meant about using Positivity in the space where it's appropriate uh, and where it's not, you know, just putting in positivity is just probably not 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 right and perhaps can also be maybe unethical, for instance, um, right? So, so for for instance, um, like in spaces like where I come from, as uh, with the with the leopard example, right? Like um, continually, uh, you know, sending out messages saying, "Oh, leopard numbers are decreasing; they're going to be decimated uh, because of people. Uh, there's no coming back." That's perhaps not helpful. 
but being nuanced yet positive yet um, yet uh, scientifically accurate perhaps is is important. And once uh, other way of saying similar messages, or oh, you know, leopards in in the mountains are, are struggling. Uh, you know, they're not the numbers are not doing well. But we know from other studies or other areas that they have a that have good recovery rate. So if you know mitigation efforts are are, are done. Uh, they can likely likely bounce back. So it's just those subtle uh, subtle points uh, that I think uh, we hope you know we communicate in a more optimistic light. Uh, and again, you know, cautioning and putting a big red flag in front of you know positivity for the sake of positivity that's not, not helpful. But in these subtle uh, areas, you know, where we can be a bit more mindful uh, while being factually correct as well. And perhaps mindful of you know people's realities in those places. Uh, if possible, we can strive to do that. In other places, you know, positivity is just not perhaps the right thing to do, and that would be, uh, yeah, I would, I would, I would stay away from that. But yeah, I don't know. I hope that sort of uh, talks about a bit of nuance. But yeah, thanks, thanks for your point. Yeah, for I think for me, it's important to be real about what we feel and what is happening in the world and, and not sugarcoat. Um, at the same time, you know, we, un I understand like the world is not butterflies and only butterflies and rainbows. Uh, you know, there is a complexity in this world and that means that there is a wide spectrum of emotions, of experiences, of impressions, of, of thoughts. And so I think we shouldn't exclude the, I wouldn't say positive negative because it's too like dichotomy. It's like, I think that it's it's a giant scale. It's like an emotions wheel, you know, there is not, you don't label some bad and some good, but you should, you should open up your communication to the complexity of what you're experiencing and what you're feeling and, and what is going on. Because as you say, as you said, Melina is people get, people can get sick emotionally. I mean, I, I personally have had climate anxiety for, I don't know how many years. And when you open up that conversation, you really, you notice, and you hear from so many others that they're experiencing the same, but then at the same time, we're trying to be so hopeful all the time that, you know, things are going to change. We're going to do this and this and this. And, and, uh, but I think it's important to open up also for yourself and for others, the, this vulnerability part where, we are, we are humans um, and we are, as humans, we experience the whole spectrum of feelings. And so that needs to be recognized in the way we act to protect um, nature, biodiversity, uh, living systems, whatever we, we, each person decides to call. But to, 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 to not shy away from also being real with, what you're feeling and what is happening in the world. Well, thank you for that, Hannah and uh, Muneeb. Uh, if anybody else would like to share anything or any questions. Yeah, I just want to just react a little bit to this. I mean, the other, the other reflections that are going through my mind hearing about this is I think we, you know, one thing I think of are the, um, the positivity that comes from fear, sadness and mourning. Um, because a lot of the emotions that we all feel now, we'll feel this throughout their lives in a lot of different ways, are uh, fear, a fear of, of, you know, negative spiral that we can't stop or powerlessness, uh, sadness about loss, and then also this question of mourning, being sad when you lose something. Um, I mean, these are all associated being with, with negative emotions, but there's a positivity in that. And this kind of ties back to my notion of the stories and, and challenge, because you know, when we're faced with sadness, when we're faced with fear, when we're faced with mourning, these are reflective moments that can allow us to to go forward, right? So, so just from 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 personal ways in our lives, you know, sadness from personal relationships, personal loss to these bigger questions, um, sadness can make you start thinking about, you know, what you need to do. Sometimes it's a release of energy. Sometimes it's a release of energy that frees you to be creative and think about other ways forward. So. Uh, and, and I think the idea of, of, of mourning is really important too, to, to be free to, to feel sad for loss. Um, you know, when we, for instance, very personal things, when we lose someone in our family, 
uh, uh, that sort of thing. It brings about a mourning and there's always a sadness which you don't have there, but then there are lessons that are reflected usually in terms of what did you learn from that person, those relationships. And that can also be thought of in terms of our reaction to the planet as well. So, uh, and then fear is a really important one too. I mean, fear is the sort of thing that you don't really get, get rid of. You find ways to place it and to use it as a, as a tool uh, for action. Thanks. Thank you so much for that, uh, uh, David, as well. Uh, if we don't have any other questions, then uh, we could slowly sequence into the other one, uh, the last session of our day. Um, and maybe then we could end our session. Uh, so we have Hannah with us, who's going to, now that everybody's got a chance to reflect on what nature means to you. Uh, Hannah has a very, uh, a, a short uh, reflection exercise that she would like to do with all of you. And uh, Hannah, I think we are running a bit uh, short of time, so we might want to do it a little shorter. So Hannah, over to you. And uh, I would be stopping the live now because now it's just a sharing between Among Us. So thank you for everybody who joined us live and do share comments with us. <laughs> Thanks, David, for the bye. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, everyone. I'm just going to...